Hi guys, welcome back to Tidal Gardens. I hope you all had a happy new year. This is the year end update on this new building construction. It's really crazy to think that we're about 14 months into this build. We've made some good progress since the last update, much of which is actually in our old greenhouse. People always ask if we're going to take down the greenhouse now that we have this new building in the works. Short answer is no. Not only are we not going to take the greenhouse down, but we're making significant improvements to it. In fact, I would argue that the improvements that we've made the past month to the greenhouse are the biggest improvement project since 2007 when we poured a radiant heated concrete floor and also completely reworked the heating of the aquaculture systems. Fast forwarding to today, and that revamped heating system from way back in 2007, it was good for its day, but it could use some help. It's been a little over 10 years now, and it got a major overhaul in the last month because of what we're able to do over in the new building. To sum it up, the commercial lock and var boilers that are in the new building will be heating the radiant heated floor of that new building. It'll also heat the four systems that are going to go in here, and also a 1,000 gallon saltwater holding tank, which we'll talk about just a little bit later. But now they will also heat the five separate systems in the greenhouse. The original heating system for the greenhouse was a Renai tankless hot water heater. It is a residential model and wasn't really designed for radiant floor heating systems, but that's what it was primarily used for. The Renai used one pump to deliver heat to the radiant floor and a second pump to deliver heat to the five systems through a manifold. The problem there is that it was just a little bit clunky. There were three main problems. The first was that there was a single temperature probe making the call for heat for all five aquarium systems. What that means is, if that one system gets chilly, it can call for heat. If any other system got chilly, that's just too bad. It's not gonna get any heat until the one with the temperature probe calls for it. Alternatively, if that system with the temperature probe calls for heat, but another system is already too warm, too bad. It's about to get a whole lot warmer. The second problem was that it was really difficult to tweak the temperature. Because we only have a single pump feeding the heated water to this manifold, the flow rates would have to be adjusted by closing down these flow control knobs. The problem there is, if they get gummed up over the years or get stuck in a certain position, it could throw off the heating to all of the systems because you're changing the flow rates. Long story short, it was not an ideal system, but it worked really well for years here. I mean, over a decade. This new system will have five separate pumps with five separate temperature probes, so each system will regulate its own temperature and all of that is gonna be handled by the heating system in the new building. I did say that there were three problems with how we used to do it. The last problem was that there was no redundancy if this Renai were to fail. The new heating system has two industrial grade boilers that can individually handle the full load of the heating duties. If one goes down, the second one will pick the heat load up and keep everything at the right temperature. As you can probably imagine, there's nothing quite as panic-inducing as a heater failure. In the past years, the Renai at the greenhouse would occasionally fail for any number of reasons, and it was a huge problem because that really is the only source of heat. The biggest cause of failure was due to the exhaust port freezing when the winter temperatures fell below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we hooked up a control panel in my house and that was directly wired to the greenhouse, so it would sound an alarm when the boiler out there sends an error code. Invariably, 
It would happen at about 3 a.m. in the middle of winter. I would have to bundle up, go out there with a hammer, and break up the ice blocking the exhaust vent and restart the furnace. Yeah, I don't expect to have that same problem with the new system. One concern that I had was the heat loss in the water lines going between the two buildings. The water lines travel underground between the buildings and they're encased in like this insulated underground channel, which would keep the lines warm, but until it's running, it was really hard to figure out how it would perform. Turns out that my concern was unwarranted because the heating system would send the water out to the greenhouse at about 130 degrees. And by the time that it came back, it would be 115 degrees. That means the water would make its way through the underground portion, through the greenhouse, to the coils in each of the sumps, do the heat exchange, and it's a 100 foot loop in the sump, go back through the greenhouse, through that cold ground again, and back to the furnace. And it was only losing 15 degrees in the process. This was a little surprising because the previous heating system would go into the water at about 130 degrees and it would come out of the water at about 80 degrees because the flow through the coil was so poor that all the heat transferred into the water. This was mainly because the old system was using just that one single pump for all five heating coils, where the new system, like I said, has five separate pumps, so there's way more flow. Since this heating system has been running, I could not be happier with the results. Just looking at the temperature graphs on my Aquan controller, you could see the moment that the new system came online. Water temperatures went from about a three degree temperature swing to a one degree temperature swing. In the spring, we're going to create a separate geothermal cooling system using the rainwater collection cistern, but I'm going to save that as a subject for a different video when the time comes. After all that, you might be wondering why not just simply have electric heaters do all this. I mean, that's pretty much what every aquarium out there uses, right? Just a regular old electric heaters. Long story short, the electrical draw simply makes that impossible. Same reason I couldn't just run giant chillers in the summer to cool the tanks down. The size of electric heaters we would need to heat these tanks would be absolutely insane. A general rule of thumb when it comes to sizing heaters is roughly five watts per gallon of water. But that's kind of assuming a decent room temperature as a baseline, not a greenhouse in an Ohio winter where clearly it's going to be substantially chillier. We would be looking at over 8,000 watts per system, which there's no way we could plug anything like that in without causing major electrical problems. For years, we were struggling with electrical capacity at the greenhouse. We couldn't plug anything in that required a lot of juice. This greenhouse didn't even have a full 100 amp to work with when it was originally constructed way back in 2002. Originally, the plan was to not have lighting at all over top of any of these tanks, and we would just be relying primarily on the sun. But over time, we went with artificial light to normalize the light exposure from season to season. When we first started, these tanks, they had maybe three devices plugged in per 1,000 gallon system, where now we have, I don't know, dozens of devices plugged in per system. It was getting to the point that plugging in another high-powered device into any outlet in the greenhouse would trip the main breaker and shut everything down. We were simply out of capacity. This brings me to the next big improvement to the existing greenhouse system. For the new building, we had a monster 400 amp three-phase service installed, which is going to be more than enough capacity to operate the new building. We took the opportunity to use some of that capacity to upgrade the electrical at the greenhouse. We also cleaned up some of the breakers to even out the electrical load because there were a couple of breakers that would trip because they just had too many devices plugged in. 
Electric isn't a super sexy topic, and most hobbyists don't really have to think a whole lot about it from like an infrastructure standpoint. I would guess that the vast majority of hobbyists, just having their tank on a dedicated 20 amp circuit is more than sufficient. But once you start talking about building sized projects, electrical demand increases and it will usually end up being way more consumption than previously estimated. I often get asked about the possibility of solar power in the future, and it is something that I would like to do, but there's a couple hurdles to it. For starters, the initial cost is still high for the volume of power that we would want. Second, the amount of sunlight that we get here in Northeast Ohio, it's not really ideal. There are a lot of cloudy days. Third, the orientation of the building's roof is not south facing, it's east west facing. So any panels that we install on the roof are not going to be getting optimal exposure. Lastly, number four, the low cost of electricity here in Ohio makes the payback period longer than in states with higher electricity prices. If we were located in, say, California or Hawaii with lots of sun and super expensive electricity rates, this would be a no-brainer. But here in Ohio, it makes the investment harder to justify. Still, there's no guarantee that electrical rates stay this low, so maybe in the future it will make more financial sense. Having said all of that, I would love to make this whole operation net zero if I could. Next up is our internet situation. Our first few attempts at running this line failed, but we tried one last time with a different parachute material, and it went through the conduit at what felt like 100 miles an hour. We carefully pulled the fiber optic line through, and now we got our 10 GBE fiber backbone from the house to the new building up and running. Thank goodness. Quick shout out to Tidal Garden's YouTube subscriber Rip Van Winkle for his suggestion to go with Ubiquity Enterprise line of the wireless access points. We now have a single Wi-Fi network for both the new building as well as the greenhouse and I'm slowly building it out as we want to have coverage all over the property. There are several buildings here and it would be nice to be able to walk from place to place and not get dropped from Wi-Fi. Moving on to the studio, there isn't a whole lot done since the last time that we looked at it. The sound panels are installed on the walls and I've made a makeshift desk area just so that I could use the space. So you see these dark charcoal DIY panels that are on the walls? I think we're going to get them moved up onto the ceiling and in their place, I'll be getting more of those professionally made gray panels. The sound absorption is just okay right now. For regular conversation, you can't really pick up much in the way of an echo, but I have really sensitive microphones and you can really hear a reverb on those, especially during a live show. Like I said, there isn't a whole lot new with the studio. It's very much still a work in progress where a little bit gets done each week. I'm in no hurry whatsoever because there are a lot more pressing needs. You gotta prioritize. Okay, moving on. The next big improvement is a system to make maintenance much easier. We installed a system of water lines to each sump in both the new building and in the greenhouse to deliver both fresh and salt water on demand. If the water level in the sump is low from evaporation, we can quickly top off with RO. If we need to replace salt water, we can quickly refill with pre-mixed salt water that's heated to exactly 77 degrees. There was a time when I was thinking of installing a continuous water change system using dosing pumps. But the more that I thought about it, there are plenty of activities that we do here on a daily basis that remove salt water from the system, such as siphoning detritus, just bagging corals for sale, making up tubs of water for pest dipping, etc., etc. So there really isn't a need to have a dosing pump system to remove the tank water. And having this salt water system on demand to top up when maintenance tasks are finished, it's much quicker and easier solution than having a device to do it. 
These water lines are already run through both buildings, and once the water containers are delivered, we can get started on building out the whole water purification system in the new building. So there's going to be a 1,000 gallon container for fresh RO water and a 1,000 gallon container for salt water. And here you can see the heating lines for that 1,000 gallon salt container. Now that these water lines are finally installed in the ceiling, the Finnish carpenter could install the ceiling paneling. The ceiling on the first floor, or I should say like that first floor space, it's filled with R19 insulation, mainly to soak up sound and vibration from activity upstairs. If you haven't caught on already, I'm really trying to minimize sound whenever possible. After the insulation is packed into that floor space, the carpenters then put in a six mil vapor barrier and then this smart panel. We're still waiting on some trim work to get done, but that sh shouldn't take too much time at all. Then we can get the painter back in here to finish painting the ceiling. In fact, by the time that this video is published, there's a good chance that the painting is already done. The next steps now are to get the HRV air exchangers installed, the trim work done, and start building all of those aquarium stands. There's a couple projects that I'm still thinking about doing, but nothing is set in stone just yet. The major construction is more or less done at this point, but I want to make sure that there's no projects that need to be done at this stage that I will regret not doing down the line. Basically, once there's tanks running in this building, I can't go and do any more major construction work or do anything where there's gonna be a lot of chemical fumes that get into the air. I really want to avoid a situation where five years down the road, I'm thinking I wish I could go back in time and do who knows, blank, but I can't because now there's all these aquaculture systems running. In any case, it's crazy to look back at this building and just see how far things have come. It's been a major undertaking getting to this point, and I'm really excited to get aquariums running in here. It's been 14 months, guys. But those tanks won't be here until April, so there's still time to do some fine tuning. All right, thanks for following along on this build. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to see future updates. We're getting close, guys. Happy reefing.